Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. I was hoping someone would say that. <laughs> I've been well fathered today, so thank you. We're in Acts 19. Turn in your Bibles, please. We're going to continue our study of the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 19 contains Luke's account of Paul's uh, visit to Ephesus uh, on his third missionary journey. He, we learned he spent almost three years there and his ministry bore much fruit. Uh, Luke made the comment in uh, verse 20 of chapter 19 how the word of the Lord was growing mighty, mightily and prevailing. But that doesn't suggest that there was no uh, conflict because of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. Uh, when Paul preached, there arose opposition, inevitably. A conflict always arose from the confrontation with the truth of Christ and first Jewish unbelief, but then uh, the paganism that pervaded uh, all of the regions that he uh, visited. Paganism was uh, pervasive at this time in history. And as the gospel was being received by many, uh, lives were being changed. Uh, a wave of joy and hope uh, spread through these regions. Uh, but there was a flip side to the story. While scores of men and women were enjoying for the first time the peace of Christ, there were uh, many others who were scandalized uh, by it. Jesus had said, don't think that I came to br bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace. Uh, but a sword. And in this latter half of uh, Acts 19 that we're going to look at today, uh, we see that flip side. Ephesus was an important city for a variety of reasons, and I won't repeat all, all of that this morning, uh, but it was the center of the cult of the worship of Artemis, uh, the pagan goddess of fertility. It was home to the grand uh, temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world. And like most religions, think about this, uh, an entire commercial structure sprung up uh, around this uh, religion. I was talking to somebody this week who has a friend who manufactures these candles uh, that have the, you see them in the different shrines and whatnot, and he's a happy camper. He's making a lot of money selling these, I shouldn't be negative because I'm going to talk about that later, but uh, <laughs> he's, make, he's making a good living uh, selling can candles. You know what I'm talking about. So uh, th this, this commercial structure uh, provided not only a vibrant economic engine, but also served the, to be the livelihoods of many of their citizens. And so Luke devotes much of this last portion of the chapter to this near riot that occurred, and I know most of you are very familiar already with, with the chapter and what's going to happen. But really, there was much more opposition even than we're going to read about uh, in uh, the, his letters to the Corinthians. Paul's going to refer to frequent imprisonments when he was there. He even talks about fighting with wild beasts, whatever that uh, means. But first, uh, Luke uh, plays the role of the historian that he is, and he puts the ministry in Ephesus in context. So let's just read the first two verses. Verse 21, now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Well, Paul had spent a long time in the city of Ephesus, but he had a plan, uh, and it was time to move on. Uh, the Lord had successfully planted the gospel on the eastern shore and the western shore of the Aegean Sea. There was a church now in Ephesus, there was a church in uh, Corinth, and it was time for Paul to get along with his plans. And since Timothy, we infer, has joined him back in Ephesus, uh, the last time we saw Timothy was back in chapter 18 when he had come with that gift uh, that enabled Paul to 
devote himself entirely to the ministry. Well, now uh, Paul sends Timothy packing in order to arrange things for this next leg of his journey. And I just want to make a simple point that this is an, an aspect of Paul's genius that is, is seldom noted. He had a keen grasp of the need for administration and, and careful planning. And it's easy to disparage those kinds of gifts in the church, but they're really uh, essential uh, to the gospel ministry in, in the local church. Uh, we tend to ignore those, but we need members and leaders with those gifts. Uh, they give direction and wisdom to the ministries and they serve to balance this kind of bull in the china cabinet uh, approach that some of us uh, tend to have always. So Paul had a sense of priorities. He planned to again go to Jerusalem. He wanted to personally deliver this gift, this relief fund that was the subject of a lot of his correspondence to the Corinthians. And then he adds, I must also see Rome. He had his eye, and we've talked about this, on these big cities. He said, I must also see uh, Rome. Uh, but we know further from the epistle to the Romans, in Romans 15, verse 28, that he, from there he wanted to go to Spain. Uh, not just Rome, he wasn't satisfied with Rome. Uh, but for a while, Luke says, uh, he would remain in Ephesus, uh, the reason for that given later in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, that a wide door for effective service had opened to him and there were many uh, adversaries. Uh, Paul's horizons, if you think of, of it that way, were wide and varied. Uh, one of the old commentators observed correctly about him, no Alexander, no Caesar, no other hero approaches to the large-mindedness of this little Benjamite. And that's well said, I think. Uh, Paul not only had plans, he passionately uh, pursued them. Uh, these weren't vacation plans. That's something I'm really good at. Uh, no, his plan was to spread the gospel of Christ to as many places as he possibly could. Listen, he wrote to the, the Colossians in Colossians 1.28. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. And then he said, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works in me. And so it was that mighty power of God working in Paul that frequently got him in trouble with the world. And that's what we see now as we continue reading about this near riot uh, that soon occurred in the city. It's a rather long description. I want to read uh, all of it in its entirety. So let's, let's go for a ride in Ephesus. Uh, verse 23, about that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. And these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades, and he said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. Now, you see in here that not, not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with the confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, uh, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, uh, the disciples would not let him. Uh, also, some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So I'm not going to talk a whole, about, uh, a whole lot about that, but these are kind of three little historical footnotes, the way, the way I read them. Paul wanted to go. Uh, they dragged Gaius and Aristarchus, uh, these Asiarchs who were friends. They were important citizens. 
Verse 32, so then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander since the, the Jews had put him forward and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus. So suddenly uh, another figure appears in the account, this town clerk. He said, men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? So since these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and to do nothing rash, for you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then... If Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there's no real cause for it and in this connection will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. And after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. So we have this man, uh, Demetrius, he's the, the president, he's the, the leader of this guild, which is something like a union of silversmiths. Uh, but the, the guild was really more than that. It was, it was a, a center of community life uh, for these men. Uh, it, it was how they were bound together in their society with these common interests. And what had happened since Christianity had come to Ephesus was that their interests had been harmed. Uh, a substantial part of their trade and therefore of their income came from the sale of these little silver shrines or amulets to Artemis uh, with her image engraved on them which worshipers could buy and use in the temple uh, for their worship or they could take them home as keepsakes. In fact, some of the, the little amulets uh, that were not made of silver but of clay have survived and we can see them in museums today. Um, the others with silver, the priest typically would take them and melt them down uh, for, for money. So, uh, as the gospel made inroads into Ephesus and into the province of Asia, and again, according to Luke in verse 20, it was doing so in a mighty way and even prevailing, uh, these silversmiths noticed this disturbing trend. And if you're a business person at all, you understand this. Uh, for the past three years or so, Ever since Paul had come in uh, with this message and had been preaching, uh, their sales had declined uh, remarkably uh, they, at an at a alarming rate. And so Demetrius naturally calls for a meeting of the silversmiths and of some of the other uh, trades people who engaged in, in similar things and had similar interests. And he's really quite clever in, in the way he, he sets this up, how he addresses it. Uh, there's the economic issue uh, for sure. In, in verse 25, you better believe it. Hey, uh, we're going to go broke. Uh, our prosperity comes from this business. So he, he blurts that out right at the beginning. So there's a great deal of reality here. Uh, but then he kind of gets control of himself a bit. He's too smart to only couch the issue in those sort of personal financial interests, so he uh, wraps it in a much more noble sentiment with three parts. First, uh, so he's speaking up for an entire way of life. Uh, he's concerned that these vaunted professions of theirs uh, might fall into disrepute. And then secondly, there's the denigration of their revered uh, goddess, Artemis. She'd be, quote, dethroned from her magnificence. And finally, the denigration of her temple. And it was a major a tourist attraction uh, for the area, area. And this Paul, he says, is the one who has threatened Artemis by convincing great 
numbers of former worshipers of her to turn away from the cultic uh, practices uh, based upon the really uh, thorny proposition that Paul has suggested, verse 26 gives it to us, that gods made with hands are not gods at all. That's a tough one to, uh, to, to deal with if you're these people. So the worshipers of Artemis believed uh, that a representation, if you look down in verse 35, you'll be reminded of it, the, the town clerk makes reference to this image which fell, which fell down from heaven. Uh, these worshipers uh, believed that sometime in the past, a representation of Artemis had fallen down from the sky. And we have some replicas, we don't have that, but we have some replicas of that image that have survived. And so, so we know it was probably a meteorite. There's probably some, some truth to it, some basis to it. But the image is in the, the form of a woman with all these projections over it uh, that look like female breasts. So this multi-breasted, grotesque uh, rock uh, became the image of the goddess of fertility, Artemis. And, and then a filthy religion uh, with cult prostitution and other practices grew up around it. Uh, it was really, uh, we, we know this from extra biblical sources, it was a, a very vile kind of religion of idolatry. Well, Paul had come in, uh, he had taught the scriptures and he had taught that God is spirit, right? Uh, uh, that he is the one that bears us. He's the one that takes care of us. He's the one that has created us. And he rather forcefully made the point, especially as he would wield Isaiah's prophecies, that uh, there's, uh, it's, the, it's absurd to fashion idols uh, with hands and then to carry them and set them down and to bow down and worship to what you just made uh, with hands. The true God, he said, is the one that we have not manufactured, but he's, in a sense, manufactured us, and he's made himself known to us, this true God has, preeminently uh, by taking on human flesh and, and pitching his tent in our midst and living a perfect life and, and bearing the perfect image of his Father in heaven and revealing his glory uh, as he walked among us. So. Uh, that was the message that the apostle had brought uh, to Ephesus. And it had been believed in and accepted by great numbers of citizens. So the contrast uh, could not have been greater from what had been the pervasive religion uh, before Paul came. Now what's hard for us to imagine today, it really is, and this is a point that James Boyce made uh, when he preached through uh, the book of Acts, is just how rampant idolatry was in the ancient world. And we can go to museums, as many of you have, and we can see uh, these statues and these artifacts from the various ancient uh, cultures and, and not realize as we look at them is that the reason that there are so many is that they, how pervasive they were. They were in the country, they were in the city, they were in <clears throat> people's homes, they had these uh, these idols that they worshipped. But the gospel of Christ uh, brought into Ephesus by Paul and the others and then spread to the surrounding regions had produced a transformation. Uh, pagan society was affected. It was altered. Uh, Boyce made the observation that remarkably within 300 years as Christianity advanced, idolatry in the ancient world simply disappeared. That's really an amazing thing. Uh, you had a, a, a world, a civilized world, uh, dominated by idolatry. Christianity comes in. Uh, the aftermath of the work that Christ did in the church, they preached the gospel, and with 300 years, idolatry has disappeared. That's not the same thing as saying that the world had become truly Christian. That's not what, what we're saying. It's just that idolatry uh, vanished. It just ended. Uh, there wasn't a kind of renaissance either, like will happen several centuries uh, later, but Christianity moved rapidly forward. And so the scene that we see here with Demetrius and the other tradesmen was evidence of that. These new Christians, 
uh, were not content simply to trade one religion for another or take on some new identity. They had actually been changed. Uh, they did things uh, differently since they trusted in Christ. And uh, they took this mandate that Jesus gave them very seriously. Their lives had been transformed so that their behavior was altered. Their practices uh, redirected. And they were so grateful for their newfound salvation and relationship with the Lord that they were excited. They told others about Jesus. This is the kind of phenomena that we should expect to see when people have been converted, when they've switched allegiances and, and trusted in, in Christ. Wherever there is true faith, uh, where the Holy Spirit truly indwells significant numbers of citizens, then cities and, and cultures should inevitably be impacted. There should be noticeable uh, differences. One of the observations that George Barna, the Christian pollster, has made over the last few decades about the United States is that professing Christians are effectively indistinguishable from professing non-Christians. Their behavior is essentially the same, the, how they spend their time, what media they absorb, how they spend their money, uh, their viewpoint, uh, viewpoints on, on the issues. Barna's polls indicate that their professed Christian faith really has little effect on them. You know this, you, we, we live side by side with these people uh, every day. And uh, he has statistics uh, illustrating that literally millions of people who profess to have been born again and have to, have to have trusted in Jesus as their savior have viewpoints and ideas that are just very much the same as those who profess not to have believed. You can analyze it I think in, in any number of ways. For one, I think in some places it's popular to be a Christian. I think the city that we live in, uh, that's true. I know um, plenty of people in the business world that go to church, uh, they go to Bible studies, uh, they talk about it, uh, they want people to know that they're, quote, a Christian. And uh, really, just giving them the benefit of the doubt, there, there is an epidemic in our church, we talk about it endlessly, of biblical illiteracy. Uh, people don't know anything about what the Bible uh, teaches. And so you get this self-centered sort of needs-based worship and community that really is a very shallow, almost counterfeit form of the faith. It's, it resembles it in some way, but not in its depths. Seems to me that the Bible in many places is used more as a, a prop uh, for a greater uh, idea that they have. And so consequently we have Christians not really living like Christians. But these believers in Ephesus were. They, they were living uh, like Christians. They were like the Thessalonians about whom uh, Luke told us uh, back in chapter 17 that the Jewish opponents complained that they were turning the world upside down. And one of the means that they, by which they did that is their, their spending patterns changed. They no longer brought, bought these little silver amulets. And that's exactly what we see reflected here in our passage with the, the really vicious response of the tradesmen. They react uh, with rage, and they start shouting out their chant. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I bet you really are glad you weren't there that day to, to hear this over and over again. And so this mob mentality uh, set in. Uh, most of those shouting, Luke says in verse 32, didn't even know what the issue was or why they were, were there. Uh, Luke had, had a wry sense of the ridiculous. But the crowd grew larger and larger as they made their way through the city streets so that they rushed to this great theater. And we know uh, from uh, archaeology uh, that this was a, a big theater. It's, it seated almost 25,000 people. 
It may not seem that big to us today with Jerry World in Arlington, but that was a big, big facility in the ancient world. And so this was a natural place for the mob uh, to migrate to. It was, it was huge, and there, there, there probably wasn't that many that got caught up in this, but they were a formidable company. And some among them quickly grabbed Gaius and Aristarchus, two of Paul's co-workers, and forcibly dragged them along. Paul, thankfully, was not with them, but naturally when he heard about it, he wanted to go and make a defense and rescue his friends. But some of these important local citizens intervened, said, no, it's dangerous, don't go. So the whole scene uh, was out of control. It was, it was a very dangerous environment. And so the Jews, who were always concerned about uh, their image, and rightfully so, because uh, their identity in, in this world was always very fragile. I'm reading a book right now on Israel. It's very good. It's kind of a history of Israel, but it just reinforced uh, the anti-Semitism that has permeated our history. It's, it's amazing. So the Jews, uh, they want to disassociate themselves with Paul and the Christians, and so they put forward this man named Alexander. We don't know who he is. Some man named Alexander, and he's going to make it clear that they had nothing to do with any of this, but once the crowd finds out he's a Jew, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have none of it. So, completely out of control, uh, this mob, again, shouts for about two hours, Luke says, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, why does Luke include this episode in his account? Let, let's try to, to figure that out because uh, the lessons are here for us if, if we'll think through it. Uh, number one, uh, Luke was an apologist for the, the, the Apostle Paul. He, he, he and you, you see this throughout the book of Acts, uh, he wants to record for posterity, uh, Paul's innocence. He had no hostility uh, towards uh, people. He had no hostility toward the state. He didn't have hostility towards different groups of people. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, I think, Luke wanted to convey, again, the satanic opposition to the gospel and, and the real danger that these early believers often faced. He calls it no small disturbance, but what it was in reality was a riot. It, 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 and the town clerk acknowledges that uh, later, and it was clearly dangerous to Paul and to the other leaders. Their lives were in danger. Their livelihoods were in danger. Their families were in danger. That's a reality uh, that we as Christians uh, often shrink from, and for good reason. Uh, no one willingly uh, wants to suffer. No one willingly wants to place themselves in harm's way. We don't like to be threatened, but the nature of the Christian life and the reality of the warfare that the Christian walk is repeatedly declared to be throughout the Bible uh, dict dictates that we be ready for it, that we expect opposition from our adversary, and therefore that we be, in a sense, consecrated to face these attacks upon us, uh, prepared and really ready to do battle. And Paul was ready. Stephen, before him, had been ready. And these new Christians in Ephesus, they're brand new Christians, if you think about it. Uh, they had confessed their sins. They had abandoned their pagan practices. They went out and sold, their, remember, their little magical books, these Ephesian grammata. They went out and sold them, got rid of them, and they openly rejected their former way of life. They, consecra they had consecrated themselves to stand firm in the face of opposition. Too often, uh, we as Christians spend uh, most of our energies making sure there are no disturbances in our lives and that we avoid any incident or circumstance that might be threatening to us. And surely you know that I'm addressing uh, myself uh, as, as well as the class. 
Uh, but any of us who are living a life uh, consecrated to the Lord Jesus and who have taken up our cross, and you'll hear this in the sermon from Dan this morning, we've taken up our cross to follow him, we're going to find enemies uh, and opposition that is hurtful and maybe even uh, danger. Some of the members of our church have found that. And yet behind all that is the sovereign hand of God who is in control of everything. And he is in these trials. Our great God, uh, the sovereign ruler of the universe, uh, he who created all things and sustains all things, uh, he is in all of our trials. And while that may not be hard to see when we're in the midst of them, it'll become clear later uh, whether in this life or in the life to come. Many examples of that in the Bible. Joseph is an obvious one, mistreated by his brothers, uh, later by this evil woman. Uh, they made his life uh, miserable for different periods in his life, but later he was able to say, it's one of our favorite verses, isn't it? To his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, to bring about this present result. Be too easy to bring up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these faithful Hebrew boys who uh, refused to bow down uh, to Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. They said, look, God, God can save us from the furnace of blazing fire, uh, and he might do it, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to serve your God. We're not going to bow down uh, to your image. And that, that kind of example, I get goosebumps whenever I talk about Shadrach, Meshach, I still do. Just awesome what they did. They stood firm for the Lord. And this, this helps us to understand the, the, the kind of uh, eternal perspective uh, that God would have us uh, have in our lives. They were willing to die because they looked beyond this life to the life that was to come. So they didn't waver in their faith, but they defied uh, the evil king. When we're faithful to the Lord, we'll we will encounter uh, trials and difficulties, but God is in them. He's using them to shape us into the people he wants us to be. They keep us strong and, and not weak. Uh, they strengthen us to be the fruit-bearing saints who live kingdom lives, who live resurrection uh, lives, as Paul will say, and, and not just muddle our way through the years uh, seeking the most comfortable places to be and the most enter entertaining things uh, to do. Cindy and I went to a memorial service on Friday for a long ago friend. His name is D. Elliot. We hadn't been around uh, D. much uh, for, for the last 15 years or so, but uh, and we, we, I remember him as, as a, a charming, engaging, fine uh, Christian man. But uh, hearing the testimonies about D. Uh, Friday uh, made me understand uh, he had become consecrated to Christ in the, over, these, over these years. And, there were, and he had a, an effect on, on hundreds of men. They had men stand up who had been uh, blessed uh, by Dee's uh, life. And it became equally apparent uh, to us that when his trial came, uh, he was well prepared. He was diagnosed with ALS about three, four years ago, something like that. Uh, this, debilitating, this debilitating disease took its inevitable toll upon him and, and he went uh, to his uh, promised glory uh, several days before the service. But he knew, D knew God was in it and until he died he was a happy warrior for the Lord uh, to the very end. And that's one of the things that Barna again identified as lacking in our church today. Not this one specifically, the church, the professing church. That sense of the battle uh, that uh, we, we are in a, a war and Barna challenged the reader to, I'm quoting, to acknowledge that your life is part of a spiritual war between God and Satan. Declare your side and get on with it. Admit that you are better off fighting the good fight and suffering on earth for the cause of Christ than winning the world but losing your soul. He said, get used to the fact that your life is lived in the context of warfare. Every breath you take is an act of war. I love that. So, yeah, I think we should ask ourselves, I should ask myself, uh, 
Have, am I consecrated? Are we soldiers for Christ? Are we consecrated and ready for warfare? Or are we so much a part of the sideline that we can say, you know, there is no riot going on around me. It's just not taking place. Well, beginning in uh, verse 35, uh, Luke records how the crisis in Ephesus came to an end with the arrival of the town clerk. You know that saying, cooler heads prevailed? <laughs> well, here's the cooler head. He is a wise uh, man. And first he appeals, notice his genius, first he appeals to the mob's uh, pride. Uh, everybody knows how important uh, we are. What man is there who doesn't know our genius, our magnificent? Uh, there's nothing that should cause us a concern. We're, we're bigger. We're bigger than that. And anyway, uh, you're overreacting. These men have made no direct assault on any of our practices. They're minding their own business. So if you do have some kind of a grievance against them, there is a place, a, a court, where you can take your uh, grievance. And what we don't want to do is bring, bring down trouble from the powerful uh, Roman authorities because we can't keep the peace. And it is a, a, a very rational appeal and that along with his authority brought an end to the crisis and an end to Luke's account. There's one last thing I want us to notice uh, before we close and I remember uh, Dan making this application several years ago because I've got it written in the margin of, of my Bible. Dan doesn't write in his Bible, but I write in mine, and it helps me at times. But uh, the town clerk's comment in verse 37, look there, about Paul and the others, is interesting because of what is said there about Paul's style of ministry. He said, you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. And what that indicates uh, is that Paul's ministry was not a negative uh, ministry. Uh, he, he, he didn't make his, it his mission to attack the pagan uh, religions. Now for sure he pointed out their errors, he pointed out heresy, uh, he said uh, you know gods made with hands were no gods. So <clears throat> there was, there, he certainly pointed out uh, how they were wrong but that was not his primary method. He knew that the gospel message proclaimed faithfully and truthfully was sufficient in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring down pagan idolatry and every other false religion or false ideology that appears to have the ascendancy uh, at whatever time we live. What Paul did was preach the Word of God. Uh, the whole counsel of God, let, he let it do its work. He knew it wouldn't return empty. Uh, he had that confidence in it. And he was right. Uh, who worships uh, Artemis today. Nobody worships Artemis, but millions and millions of people, including all of us, I think, uh, in this room, we've heard the gospel message. Uh, the Holy Spirit has moved in our heart and, and transformed us and gloriously uh, saved us, and, and now we worship Him. We come here to worship the, the true God, the God of the universe. Uh, we come here to exalt Jesus Christ, uh, we come on Sunday evening and we observe the Lord's Supper and we remember Him. That's who we remember. We don't remember uh, Artemis. Uh, you know, th forget Artemis. Throughout the centuries, I think it's fair to say, Satan has continually raised up one hostile ideology after another to try to threaten God's truth, to try to tumble uh, His kingdom. But Martin Luther was right. Let's close with this. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, will we? For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. His kingdom is forever. We should sing that. We'd have time, but no. Should we? Yeah, what a way to end it. Let me pray and then we'll, we'll sing that. Father, thank you that your kingdom is forever. Thank you that your truth uh, triumphs through us. Uh, what a blessing to know that. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the uh, work of the Spirit in our lives. And we pray with petition now that you would more and more uh, consecrate our lives.